Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Ian Muirhead. I'm the current chair of the OU Space Science Club and I'm the host for this evening. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. It's great to see so many. Um, I can see the numbers are ticking up as I'm talking um, and the enthusiasm that the members have shown has been absolutely brilliant. Before we start with tonight's talk, then I'll just go through a bit, a bit of admin. Um, a reminder that tonight's session is being recorded um, and will be available on YouTube later. And welcome to everybody who's watching the recording later. Uh, today, today's session will be a talk of around 40, 45-ish minutes. Um, and then at the end of that, the recording will be stopped and then we'll have a question and answer session after. Um, if you've got any questions that as the talk uh, goes, please feel free to put them in the chat and I can ask them on your behalf. Or when we go into the question, question and answer session, um, we can put your hand up and I can nominate people to come forward. Um, I hope everything's clear tonight and I think it's time to introduce tonight's speaker. So I'm really pleased this is one we've absolutely been looking for and uh, she's one of our own. I think there's a football song that goes like that. Um, we've got Natalie Starkey here tonight who's the OU uh, Outreach Officer. Good evening, Natalie. Good evening. It's nice to see so many of you. I can see some of you on my screen, but I know there's lots more that I can't see <laughs> that are in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's re really good. Obviously, a lot of enthusiasm for seeing uh, your talk tonight. I think we've just reached 90 people. Wow, brilliant. OK, it's amazing, isn't it? How much difference it makes um, doing things online. We're getting generally much better turnouts for things. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, so the, the floor is yours, Natalie. If you'd like to share your screen and start your talk, we'd love to hear it. OK, great. Thank you. I'll just get sharing and make sure I share the right thing. I'm more used to Zoom than uh, Teams. There we go. Yeah, that's all come up good. Brilliant, that was faster than it was for me. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for coming along everyone. Um, so this uh, talk is gonna be centered mostly around a book which I wrote, gosh, I wrote it like four years ago now and it came out um, actually three years uh, to the month. Um, and it's called Catching Stardust, which you probably realized from the, the title of the talk. Um, and it's about comets and asteroids and the birth of the solar system. And what it really is doing is looking back at much of the work I did um, actually at the Open University um, during my research career. So I like to start off as a bit of an aside before I tell you a little bit about how I got into what I'm doing and a little bit about myself. Um, I'm sure many of you realise that Earth is actually hit by space rocks all the time. It's a really, really common event. Um, many people don't realise it happens. Um, the main important thing to realise is that actually five to 300 tonnes of dust fall every single day onto the Earth. So it's pretty harmless. This dust is, is literally smaller than the width of a human hair. We can't see it, um, but it does make its way down to the surface of the Earth. But obviously, when it gets here, it's mixed in with all the terrestrial dust that we have. So it's really, really hard to see um, and we, we can collect it, but it's really hard to collect on the surface of the Earth. So it's falling all the time. It's literally mostly 70% uh, of it comes from comets, we think. Um, and that's just the comets that have gone by the Earth and, and deposited some dust as they go. And we're literally just passing through that stream of, of comet dust. So that happens all the time. So thankfully, there's an inverse relationship between the size of material that falls from space and the frequency with which it falls. So this is good, but what it does mean is that if we have a really large piece of space dust, so if we're talking actually a piece of rock, um, could be 10 kilometers in size, could be even larger, that would be extremely um, infrequent for that to happen. So the problem is that if it does happen, it's gonna be really catastrophic as we learned with you know, the dinosaurs um, 65 million years ago. It was a bit of a problem if we have a big piece of space rock coming, but it doesn't happen very often. So we just have to remember that we are a planet in space. And I think a lot of people think of the earth as sort of different to the other planets, but we are a planet in space. We're traveling around the sun with all these other objects. And so we are you know, subject to the things that just happen in space every day. Um, I think I just need to press play on this one. So um, there shouldn't be any sound on this, so don't worry if you can't hear anything. Um, a couple, well, I guess February 28th this year, um, you probably were all aware that the uh, this really bright fireball appeared over the south of England. Um, now it deposited a rock known as now the Winchcombe meteorite. Um, now this kind of event, 
in terms of a fireball coming through the sky is not particularly common. But what's even less common is that when we see a fireball, we can actually go out and collect a sample of rock that actually falls onto the surface of the Earth. And it's really, really, really uncommon for us to be able to do this in the UK, partly because um, we're covered in vegetation. So it's really hard to find these rocks sitting on the ground. Generally, people go to look for meteorites in deserts. So we'll look in cold deserts like Antarctica and hot deserts like the Sahara, because it's really easy to spot a dark black rock on a surface of, of ice or, or sand. Move on to the next slide. Um, there we go. So it was really exciting for space scientists to actually see this event. Um, it was photographed by a camera network across the UK. So they were able to triangulate the, um, the kind of fall um, area that this fireball should have deposited some rock. Um, and you can see on the, the lower left hand image there, they sort of created that trajectory on Google Maps and circled a little area in the UK around Gloucestershire. And we're like, this is where it's fallen. We need to go and have a look. And sure enough, some members of the public ended up finding some of this rock. It was just absolutely fascinating. So the guy in the middle of this picture here is Richard Greenwood. He is a research fellow um, who I've worked with for about a decade now, um, and he's worked on meteorites all of his career. He was the first scientist, at the Open, and he was, he's from the Open University, to actually go out and um, identify uh, the first piece of this fallen rock. And the first piece was found by Mr and Mrs Wilcock on their driveway. It's just insane. So you can see um, the mark there and next to the picture of Richard um, you've got the mark here of where the meteorite fell. Now it was a really what we would consider friable meteorite so it broke up very easily when it hit the ground and you can see that it's left this kind of um, impact uh, mark on, on the ground where it all kind of fell apart. Um, but that's really exciting because it means it's a really primitive meteorite. It's come from an asteroid that we don't get to sample very often because these meteorites, when they come through the Earth's atmosphere, often break up and they're really, really hard to find. So the picture here of the person in the lab is one of our PhD students, Ross Findlay. He, I think, is his second year. So he's had this fantastic opportunity to actually work on the oxygen isotope analyses of this rock. And that's one of the first um, analyses that we tend to do on a piece of rock that that we think has come from space um, because it tells us exactly where it's come from. You can use oxygen isotopes as a sort of fingerprint for where um, rocks came from, where they come from Mars or, or from different types of asteroids. So he was so lucky that he got to do those analyses. Um, and as it says on the slide, it's the first UK meteorite in 30 years. So it has caused quite a bit of excitement. At the end of the talk, I'll post a little link um, to some material we put on OpenLearn, um, the Open University kind of um, free learning site. Uh, we've put in a load of articles which I've had some of us write and we made a nice little explainer video which you can maybe look at and share with, with your friends if they're interested in this stuff. But it's a really exciting event. There's lots more to learn from this meteorite, but now lots of universities in the UK are basically fighting over it to try and figure out who's going to do which analysis and who's going to get you know the most exciting results from it. So it's all ongoing. So it's exciting stuff. Um, so a little bit about me. How did I get to be doing what I'm doing now. Um, I actually started out as a geologist, hence why you'll probably hear my excitement over a piece of rock. I am, I do get very excited about pieces of rock. Um, so I studied my um, for my MSI at uh, Durham, and then I went up to Edinburgh to actually do my PhD in geochemistry. So at the time, you can see me in the lower picture here, smashing up a piece of rock in Iceland. Um, I was out in the field a lot. I collected samples from, um, from volcanoes in Iceland, and I didn't get to go to Greenland and Baffin Island, but I also looked at samples from those places as well. And I got really excited about um, understanding kind of how the Earth formed, and I used these rocks to try and understand information about, you know, how basically how the Earth formed as a planet, rather than looking at it um, from a very internal way. I was kind of looking at it from the outside, trying to figure it out like we would look at Mars and try and figure out how that formed. I then went down to the Open University to do two postdocs. So this um, I spent about seven years um, at the Open University the first time. And I moved into analysing comet and asteroid samples. Um, and a lot of people think that's a bit of a strange leap from analysing volcanoes to then analysing comets and asteroids. But it's really, um, it, it's not much different because they're all rocks. Uh, they might be rocks from space or they might be rocks from the Earth, but they all contain similar minerals that we can analyse with the same kind of techniques. And we're just looking um, at answering different questions with them. But ultimately, it's all related to figuring out stuff about the solar system. 
Now, I became really interested in um, the NanoSIMS instrument, which is one of um, the, it's a really cool uh, kind of mass spectrometer that we have at the Open University. And I became lab manager of that because I got really interested in kind of running that instrument. And it's insanely complicated, um, but it, it kind of, it, it really got me. I just really enjoyed working in there. So I was kind of doing a bit of that and a bit of comet and asteroid an analysis. So. Um, unfortunately, I did have to leave behind my research career. Um, my husband's job was moving out to the US and I decided I would go with him because I didn't want to miss the opportunity um, to live in a different country. So it was at this point that I'd decided I, I'd been approached by publishers to sort of write a book about vaguely about comets or asteroids. So I decided I was going to write Catching Stardust and that's where that kind of came from. So I spent my time in California um, you know, swimming and being out in the sun and writing Catching Starless. It was really idyllic. Um, and then I actually signed a commission to write Fire and Ice, which is my book, which will be out in September, and that's on space volcanoes. So I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of the talk. I moved back to the UK and sure enough, I came back to the Open University because I love it. I think it's a fantastic place to work. Um, and I'm now a public engagement officer for physics um, at the Open University, but I continue science writing and science communication in general in my freelance time. Um, so yeah, I'm, you might notice the public engagement officer for physics, which is a bit weird because if you look back through my um, CV there, I don't mention physics at all. And it's correct, I haven't actually studied physics since I was 16. Um, but the weird thing is, is that I've worked in physical sciences for over a decade. So I've got a lot of knowledge about the kind of physics that we do in, in um, the School of Physical Sciences at the OU. So, and I know the, the scientists really well, so I help them um, communicating their science to the public. What's my next slide? Here we go. Pretty pictures, here we go. I like to kind of show um, people the fun side of being a scientist um, because I have really, really enjoy communicating with the public and it's actually where I now feel happiest. Like I absolutely loved being in the lab. I loved analysing samples. I loved going into the field and collecting rocks. But I feel like now uh, what I'm doing is, is the best part of me. So I've worked on the sky at night. I've worked with Startalk Radio in the US with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I ended up writing a planetarium show for um, the American Museum of Natural History's planetarium. Um, and that, that uh, sadly opened just before lockdown, but it's, it's now reopened again because um, it was shut for about a year. Um, and I've done all sorts of different things. And I just, it's just been really exciting to be able to talk to people and, and write about science and kind of, you know, show my enthusiasm um, for all the stuff that I've learned over the years. So how does a geologist get into space? I've sort of covered this a bit already. As I said, the main link is this NanoSIMS instrument, which I've got an image of here. Um, it looks really boring, but it's amazing. Um, it's just really, really cool. It's got, um, it's basically, yeah, the mass spectrometer part is connected to a microscope. So you can look in insane amounts of detail um, at rock samples. So you're literally looking at things at the, the micron scale. So you can really pick apart um, these rocks in detail, which is really important for samples from space because comet samples, for example, contain really, really tiny pieces of dust which we need these kind of instruments to, to analyse. So not only did I work on comets and asteroids, because I was running that instrument for other people, I got to analyse pieces of Mars, the Moon, it was all sorts of stuff. So it was a really exciting few years um, when I was doing my research. So I guess what I've done is I've gone from studying Earth to studying space, but then the way I like to think about the reason I study space is to really come back to understanding the Earth. So I'll explain a bit more about that. Um, the Earth, I don't know how many of you know a lot about geology, but I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, will have heard of plate tectonics. So the Earth is a complicated planet. Um, we are still really, really active, as you're probably aware. We have volcanoes and earthquakes happening all the time. And that's partly because we still have a very warm interior, a very hot interior that fuels um, the inside of our planet and keeps it, it keeps it warm. And it basically powers plate tectonics at the surface. It keeps our geology really interesting, but the problem with it is that if we want to understand our 4.5 billion year history, it makes it really, really hard to unpick because that plate tectonics has moved things around over the you know millennia and has meant that, sorry, I don't know, that apologies, my dog barking out the door, she's desperate to come in, but I'm just going to ignore her. Um, so it's moved things around. So the surface of our planet has changed continuously, meaning that if we want to understand what it looked like at the start when it formed, we barely have any rock left from that time. So 
it's really tricky for us to unpick our history. We just have, you know, we can go back a little bit, but much of our, our Earth's surface is relatively new. When I say new, it's still millions of years old, but in terms of billions of years, it's not that old. So one of the ways we can understand Earth a bit more is to actually go into space and look at the objects around us. Now, if we just go to our closest neighbour, the moon, first of all, it really reflects that 4.5 billion year history that we've sort of lost on our surface. If we look up at the moon um, on a nice clear night, and you've got a beautiful telescope, you can look at it, um, you'll see that it's heavily cratered. We all know the moon is covered and pockmarked with craters. Now, what this tells us is that the moon was bombarded by comets and asteroids over its history. Now, we're obviously right next to the moon. So what we can expect is that the Earth was also bombarded by these same objects around the same time as the moon. It's not like Earth escaped this process. The reason we don't see those crater, that cratering history, is simply because it's been lost due to plate tectonics. It's literally been subducted back in, into the Earth and lost. So when we look at the moon, we know that our history has been very similar. We've had that very cataclysmic history just like the moon. So it's a really important place to start if we just want to understand where we got to or where, where we came from. One of the other reasons we want to go and look at other planets and objects around us is to understand where life and water came from on Earth. You may have noticed that Earth is the only planet we know of with life and we are the only planet or um, body in the solar system that has liquid water at the surface. There is water on other um, objects in the solar system, other moons, and but it's all under the surface. There, there's no liquid water on the surface. So we are really special and we are really different to those other places. And one of the things we want to try and understand is why is Earth different? Why is it that water and life are linked in some way? Do we need plate tectonics for life um, as well? are all these things interlinked and is that why we don't see life anywhere else in the solar system so they're quite obviously quite big questions we're trying to answer and we can't just do that by looking at our own planet we must look at the things around us that are different and try and figure out why they're different so then it brings me on to why comets and asteroids so of course we can look at mars we can look at venus and my next book does look at those planets and explores them in more detail to learn about our own planet but in catching stardust they look at the comets and asteroids because they can tell us an awful lot about where we came from because they're the oldest objects in the solar system now we're more used to seeing images like this of um, comets and asteroids this is um, a comet um, and it's absolutely beautiful and um, when they're in the night sky i don't know if you've been able to ever photograph one or see it through a telescope but they're absolutely fascinating and they're beautiful um, and people have been seeing them for, for thousands of years and you know before people were maybe a bit scared of them because they didn't know what they were in the night sky nowadays we understand a lot more about them and we can just enjoy their beauty. Um, what you see there is a bright streak behind the comet. So at the front of the comet, you've got the nucleus, which is the rocky part of the comet. And that contains dust and ice um, and gases. And as it's heated up, as it goes towards the sun, those um, ices uh, sublimate and stream off the back of the comet and take dust with them. So you can end up with a few different tails behind a comet, which um, this picture kind of shows really beautifully. And they get deflected in different ways um, as it goes around the sun. So they are a really beautiful sight, but equally they can tell us a lot about um, where we came from. So we'll take a step back. So we need to understand where comets and asteroids came from if we can then use them to understand where, where we came from. So eons back, um, before the solar system formed, um, basically we were just a big cloud of stuff in space. Um, and as that cloud started to kind of, um, um, uh, what's the word, um, gravitationally um, condensed together, we got clumps of stars forming. Um, so you can kind of see that in, in the second image. And in those clumps of stars, you then start to condense a disk out of it. Um, so there's lots, of, basically it's called a stellar nursery. You've got lots and lots of stars forming, and then you've got a disk forming around around those um, stars. And within that disk, initially, there's no planets. What we've got is it's a disk of debris that forms soon after that star formed. It's the leftover star forming material. And it's made of all the stuff that was in this original um, cloud of material in, in the galaxy. 
Now, what gradually happens is that actually the material in, in this disk, in this circumstellar disk, starts to gravitationally um, attract it to each other and start to form planets. So we actually ended up with um, our eight planets um, around our sun, but it takes a while to get there. Now, you might question how we know this process happens. Um, and one of the reasons we know is because we can actually see it happening. So the top image here is um, showing you uh, an artist's impression of uh, a, a newly forming solar system and you've got some fresh planets forming. But the bottom image here is from the ALMA telescope and it's actually a young star which is 450 light years away but it's at this stage where it's literally forming its planet. So you've got the star in the middle, the bright yellow, and then where you see these dark rings around it, that's literally planets excavating their orbit around the sun. So we can liken this to the theory that we have and we can say, well, this literally this is this star at this point is forming its solar system around it of planets. And I just think that's fascinating. This image actually came out during one of my postdocs and it was it, we spent a whole week talking about it. It just tells us so much and it kind of validates all of that theory. It's absolutely beautiful. And actually, if you go to look at the images from this telescope, there's loads more and, uh, and they're all fascinating. So I urge you to do that. So getting to the comets and the asteroids, we've got this early um, this early disk of material, um, probably just before the planets formed, uh, we actually, in the really outer edges of this disk, where it's very cold and far from, from the star, the central star, we form the comets. The comets are literally just, um, imagine just taking a scoop of this cloud, and this cloud is made of um, dust and ice particles, and you basically scoop up that cloud, um, like you might with freshly fallen snow, and maybe mix in a bit of dust into there, a bit of dirt, and you compact it very slightly. So you wouldn't, it wouldn't make a very good snowball to throw, it would probably disintegrate as you threw it, but that's essentially what a comet is. It's a very loosely bound clump of, of ices and, um, and dirt, essentially. Now the asteroids are quite different in that respect. They formed very slightly after the comets, but just kind of at the same time as the planets, or just before. And they form much closer to the sun. So they contain much rockier material. So the sun basically um, heated up all this gas and dust right next to it. And it formed different high temperature minerals and different phases of rock. And they all came together to form the asteroids. So the two objects should be very different. We should have very loosely bound, very fragile, cold stuff in the comets and high temperature materials in the asteroids. And that's something we should keep in our heads. That's sort of the presentation that you'll find in um, most old um, textbooks. Um, in fact, textbooks that haven't been updated will still have this, um, this distinction between comets and asteroids um, because it was believed that this was the case and this was until we went to visit them in space and actually start finding out more about them in detail. But just keep that in your mind for now that there is should be a distinction in theory. Uh, right, hold on. Here we go. So, Comets and asteroids, I've sort of always been fascinated by them. I think before I even had any idea I was going to be um, studying them as part of my career, um, I've seen Armageddon and Deep Impact. I think I must have been in my teens when these came out. I can't remember when, when they did come out. But I was absolutely fascinated by the idea that these objects, you know, could really change the face of the Earth um, or, you know, that we'd need to do something about one colliding with our planet in the future. So it's very much this like feared or revered. Obviously, I, I very much revere comets and asteroids, having spent a career analysing them, but they have been feared for a long time. And it's actually tends to be comets that have been feared, mostly because it's them that we can see in the night sky. Asteroids, as I explained, don't tend to contain ice because they formed much closer to the sun. So it was too hot for ices to condense there. So they don't tend to produce tails as they fly through the night sky. Um, and so we don't see them. So in a way, they should be even scarier than the comets because we can't necessarily see them coming. They're very dark objects. Um, whereas comets, when they produce a tail, are very, well, relatively easy to spot. I mean, as far back as 1066, um, Comet Halley actually appears in the Bayer Tapestry, and it's meant to be seen as a bad omen for King Harold because he was just about to, um, I think, die because of the Norman invasion and William the Conqueror coming into the UK, or whatever it was at the time, England, I suppose. Um, and so it's seen as a bad omen for him. I quite prefer to look at it the other way because for William the Conqueror, it's obviously quite a good omen that the comet's there. Um, but hey, we look at it from the respect of Harold, who poorly, poor, poor thing, he didn't survive the experience. Um, but Halley's Comet is this interesting one because 
it's on a it's called a short period comet so it comes via the earth about every 76 years um so it's been spotted throughout history um and you know you could be lucky enough to maybe see it twice in a lifetime which would be amazing but in new york in 1910 um another time when it passed the earth mass hysteria broke out because camille flammarion who was a chemist at the time predicted that it was going to create laughing gas in the atmosphere when it went by and actually kill everybody and they started selling comet inhalers to, uh, you know, to protect people and comet umbrellas at the time. Of course, it was all complete madness. Um, and and no one, you know, went by, everyone saw it and, uh, and no one died. But this is the kind of thing when we don't know about these objects, and we don't know anything about our enemy, then we don't know how we're going to defeat it. So it's one of those things that we want to learn more. So I always, I'm sure you're all aware where the comets and asteroids kind of sit in the solar system. But I, I love to show you this kind of slide because it always blows my mind every time I think about these objects. So we're pretty sure, you know, the asteroid belt, fine, that's between Mars and Jupiter. The asteroids sit there orbiting quite happily. They're the leftover remnants of um, the formation of, of the rocky planets. Um, they're pretty much the same composition as the rocky planets. Um, in That's Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Um, and they sit there quite nicely. There's quite a few nearer. Earth asteroids and the near Earth asteroids are the ones that end up on different orbits and can come closer um, to, to our own planet and they're the ones that we sort of need to worry about. But the comets, on the other hand, are really, there's so many of them and they're, they're so, so far away from us. So the main, uh, the first place that we'd get to would be the Kuiper Belt. And that's just past the orbit of Neptune. Um, and this is where the short period comets come from. So these, uh, the Kuiper Belt is in the same plane as the planet. So um, you, you, it looks like the Oort Cloud is as well here, but I'll explain in a minute that it's not. So these objects come in on the same plane and they pass, um, they go towards the sun um, and and like Halley's Comet, and, and they go back out again to um, roughly the Kuiper Belt region. So there's a lot of comets that come from this region. Of course, Pluto is also within the Kuiper Belt, and there's some really, really large objects out there, and that's partly why um, Pluto is no longer classed as a planet, because there are other objects out there that are just as big as Pluto, um, and so it's now a dwarf planet. But it's a weird part of the solar system. Basically, all these objects are icy, but we don't know exactly where they all formed. Um, it's a really unexplored region um, that we need to go and see in more detail, but we so far, I think, only had three spacecraft um, venture out that way. The Voyager have gone through, and we've got New Horizons still going through the Kuiper Belt. Now, to get to the Oort Cloud, I always have to write this down because I always forget. So if you take the distance from um, the sun to the edge of the Kuiper Belt, to get to the edge of the Oort Cloud, it's 2,000 times that distance again. So it's just insanely different to the distance getting to the Kuiper Belt. So the objects on the edge of the Oort Cloud are actually very loosely bound to our star, such that um, just as our um, solar system moves around the galaxy, a passing star can actually dislodge some of these objects on, on the outer edge and send them on, on a different orbit, which can bring them towards the sun because the sun is the largest object and it, it kind of pulls them with its gravity towards it. Now, this is um, the, the projection of the long period comets, the ones that um, you know can be on very long orbits, like 2000 years or whatever. But so that's how they end up coming into the solar system. Um, they're, again, we don't know much about the Oort Cloud. We've never been there um, and we can't, so we've never seen it. We can't see it with telescopes because these objects are so small and dark and so far away that we don't actually know they're there. We just predict that these objects are there. So the Oort, the Oort Cloud is thought to be in a shell around the solar system. So the objects are not sitting in the same plane as the planets and Kuiper Belt. Um, and that's how we know they're there because as these objects are, are pushed out of their orbit and come towards the sun, we see them coming in at all different random angles from below, from above, and so they, they are not sitting in the same plane. So we know this, or we predict there should be this shell of, of, of icy objects around the solar system. Um, and I've got this, this in here as well. Uh, actually, the Oort Cloud is a third of the distance to the closest star, um, which is just insane. Like, that's such a distance away. Um, 
And just to, to stress this point even further, because this is fun, if it takes you one hour to travel from the sun to the earth, then assuming you could travel at the same speed, um, it would take 9.2 seconds to travel to the moon, which would be very cool. It would actually take 208 days to travel from the sun to the Oort cloud going at that speed and 11 years to travel from the sun to the edge of the Oort cloud. So this is why exploring the Oort cloud is not very easy to do and therefore waiting for objects um, to come to us from it is a much easier way to analyse pieces of those comets. So how do we analyse? Well, we've, I've just, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk the Winchcombe meteorite because it was such a topical thing that happened um, this year. But of course, meteorites fall to Earth, as I've mentioned at the beginning all the time. And um, the ones that tend to survive, um, unlike Winchcombe, it, it kind of it did survive, but it did break up on, on the ground when it got to us. But the ones that tend to survive more are the metallic asteroids. Um, so these are made of iron and nickel, mostly iron, and they're very hardy. So we have a lot of these. So we could say that these meteorites are quite overrepresented in our meteorite collections. But they can tell us a lot about, um, about the planets because these iron asteroids actually came from asteroids that got really big that they segregated like the planets, like the terrestrial planets, into a core and a mantle and, and pro probably a crust. And then when they broke up by maybe colliding with another asteroid, that's when we get chunks of these meteorites um, potentially on Earth crossing orbits. But equally, they cause more damage when they, they hit the Earth because they are very dense. Um, and so we end up with some big craters. So sure enough, we do have some craters on Earth, but just not as many as the Moon. So meteorites are great. You'll hear a lot of the OU scientists talking about their love of meteorites. They're free samples of space. We don't really have to do anything to get them. But one of the downsides is that we don't know exactly where they came from. So we were able to look at the trajectory of the Winchcombe fireball, and sure enough, people have been able, scientists have sort of been able to calculate from where they think it originated and they think it came probably from um, the outer asteroid belt. That's probably more based on its composition being quite primitive um, and, and we think therefore it contains some water and it's come from that edge of the asteroid belt where it's colder. So, but we don't know where they came from. We couldn't say, oh, this one came exactly from this particular asteroid that we can see in space. Um, unless you get a piece of Mars, then that's the only way that we would know that an object came from Mars because we've got, um, we've sampled Mars on the surface and know what it should be like. But the great thing about meteorites is that they sample a really wide range of objects. Um, there's no way that we could send enough space missions up to go and analyse all those different asteroids within a year that we can measure in our, in our meteorites. So that's a really fantastic thing. We've got a huge sample, which is great. But obviously when they arrive, as I've mentioned, it's sometimes rather catastrophic um, and we certainly don't want a large one arriving um, any time soon. Um, and as I've said, they do favour rocks that survive atmospheric entry, which is good and bad. Um, because obviously if you uh, have got a really big piece of meteorite arriving and it's something that's going to break up as it comes uh, through the atmosphere, then that's good because it won't hit the planet. Now, some of the stuff I worked on was these um, the dust sized uh, particles. And as I explained, we have lots of them arriving on Earth every single day, but we don't collect them on the surface of the Earth because they are very hard to distinguish um, amongst all the terrestrial dust. So actually what NASA have done for years is send up um, the it's basically a U2 spy plane, which they've adapted for research purposes. It's called an ER2 um, and you can see a picture of it here. And on the bottom of the wings, um, they've installed these little sticky pads collectors which you can see in in the middle picture and they essentially act like fly paper or sticky fly paper so when the aircraft is up at altitude at 25 kilometers or whatever it goes in the stratosphere um these pods open up so they're kept clean and then they open up and um they've basically covered in silicon silicone oil which uh, just collects particles raining down now, obviously up at these altitudes you're not going to have much terrestrial dust um there's actually a bit of spent rocket fuel up there which is quite interesting um so some of the sample I got were these aluminium blobs which were very clearly not comet dust and and that is simply um, leftover rocket fuel that's sitting up there which I always found quite fascinating um, but what we do is we collect these samples that fly down then they come back down bring them to the lab in the lab and I got to go over to NASA um, at Houston and work in their amazing labs and collect um, basically pick these tiny samples of these collectors which was hard to do because they are very small this one here um, 
well, it's about five microns across. I've shown a scale bar in red of one micron, that's a millionth of a meter. They are teeny tiny and very, very hard to work with. But what you can see here is the excruciating detail that um, this, this rock is showing us. It's made up of really, really fine grain dust. You can see a few larger pieces of rock minerals in there. But basically what you're missing here is the icy material that would have formed that comet and held that rock together um, because that obviously was destroyed as this particle came through the atmosphere. Then these micrometeorites are the things that make shooting stars. So every time you see a shooting star, it's a piece of 4.5 billion year old dust burning up as it comes through the atmosphere, which is kind of sad, but also kind of lovely to think about. Um, but I analysed these for years using that particular nano sims instrument um, and we could pick apart the detail. We could literally have a look at one of the tiny pieces of dust and um, figure out what it was, if it was a pre-solar grain that came from um, a star outside of our solar system that was there before our solar system even formed. So we've got material older than the solar system in here, which is crazy. Um, they are incredibly hard to work with um, and we don't know where they came from. So I think I mentioned at the beginning, 70% roughly we think come from comets, but many of them could have come from asteroids. And the problem is we just don't know. So we can analyze a wide range of objects, but it's very hard for us to pinpoint exactly where they came from. Um, but I still love them and I, yeah, I would love to work on them still, but uh, sadly I don't. So visiting and sampling space is the next step. We obviously can rely on meteorites, they arrive, they're free, they're great, and there's lots we can do with them. But going into space is just the next step, which is gonna be even better. Now, obviously the Apollo missions were fantastic and they collected you know, 500 kilograms of rock samples and brought those back to earth. And those samples are still being analyzed and will be analyzed for decades to come. But they came from a very relatively restricted region on the moon, um, and that's just one object. So we've got a lot of material from there, but we didn't even sample the whole of the moon. So we've still got loads more to learn about just that one object. When we go and visit comets and asteroids, as we explain, there's loads of them out there, and actually they're all different. So to analyse just one comet doesn't necessarily tell us about all of them. Um, the first mission, and one of uh, the, it's the first mission I worked on, it's also um, the first sample return mission from a comet or asteroid, um, and it was the NASA Stardust mission, and it was relatively low cost um, for as far as space missions go. Um, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute how it worked, um, and that's one of the main chapters in my book uh, because I just absolutely love this mission and the fact it just seems crazy how they collected the samples and it actually worked. Um, I also concentrate on the Rosetta mission, which wasn't a sample return mission. It was actually designed to be initially, um, but to go to an object in space and come back actually doubles the cost of a mission because it's essentially two missions in one. You've got to go and you've got to launch something and come back with it. So it is expensive and we'd never done it before. So with Rosetta, it was the first time we'd actually gone to land on an object, in um, a, a small object in space. And so they went there and put a lander down which was also amazing and that the Open University has a huge um, involvement in that mission. But of course, then we've had OSIRIS-REx and we've had Hayabusa 1 and 2 that have gone to asteroids and have brought back or are bringing back samples um, within the next few years. So there's a lot going on at the moment that um, is looking at sampling these objects in space to learn more about them. So the NASA Stardust mission, well, it went to, it was aiming to go to this comet called 81P VILT-2. We didn't know much about this comet before we went there. Um, and it was, yeah, so this mission was basically designed to be quite simple. They thought we don't know how to land on this object. We don't know what it looks like in detail. So what we're going to do is simply fly through the tail of the comet as it goes towards the sun. Um, and on the back of the, uh, the spacecraft, they had this tennis racket style collector, which popped up once they were in space. Um, it kept it clean all the way there, popped up and it's, it had um, this collector, which was made of aerogel. I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute because it's a really cool material. So on this collector, there were little pods um, of aerogel that would collect samples. And you can see here um, this little small, tiny hole that hopefully you can see on your screen. That's actually a piece of comet dust that came off the back of that um, VILT-2 comet and impacted the collector and was preserved really nicely in the aerogel. So then they brought back um, that, the top of that collector was going to jettison back um, to Earth and the Stardust mission actually continued on um, to collect interstellar dust. Um, and so sure enough, it came back and we were able to analyze samples. So my first postdoc, this is basically what I was employed um, to work on. Obviously, NASA and the US did a lot of the analysis, but they open up um, 
sample analysis to the rest of the international community once they've done their initial analysis. So I got to work on some of kind of the second phase of, of this. So this aerogel stuff um, is really cool. It's a, it's a silicon based solid with a porous structure where 99% of the volume is open space. So I've actually held some of this in the lab, the stuff that wasn't used in flight, um, and it, it doesn't weigh anything. It's, it's weird. It's so like you're not even holding anything. Um, it's a thousand times less dense than glass. So it's often called solid air or frozen smoke. Now, the beauty of it is um, that it can collect samples that are flying very quickly and decelerate them rapidly in a short space without heating them up, which is really important because if you heat up your comet sample, you're going to change it in some way and you're going to lose some of that initial material and some of that information. Um, so basically, the pieces of um, dust that were coming off this comet were traveling about six kilometers per second, so faster than a speeding bullet, and they had to be decelerated um, within less than a centimeter. Um, and so this is what happened. The comet particle hits at the front here where I've got the arrow going in. It explodes a little bit and, and deposits material all over this explosion area, but then the hardiest piece pieces of those dust, um, so it might be rocky grains that are contained within there, funnel through um, because they're denser and they end up depositing um, at the end of these tracks here. So these are called um, tracks and then these are called the terminal particles. So these are the solid grains that survived impact. There is a lot of material in the first bit, but it's very hard to get out of the aerogel. So it was really these grains that, that we were concentrating on analysing. Now, the other thing, the other way that they actually collected samples was a bit of an accident because they lined each of these aerogel blocks with um, foil so that they simply so that they could cut the foil, slit it and then pull out those aerogel blocks for analysis. What they didn't anticipate was that quite particles would hit this foil, this very hard, unforgiving surface at six kilometres per second. And actually, um, of course, they were expecting them not to survive entry. And sure enough, they didn't, but they um, did deposit some material in a crater. So um, some fantastic work uh, led by um, Anton Kearsley, who was a scientist at the Natural History Museum, looked at um, using a scanning electron microscope to analyse um, the, the, the debris that was left um, when these pieces of rock actually hit the collector. So it's extra samples that we just didn't even know we were going to get. So this is the kind of grain down here. Um, it's basically um, it's a very small piece of very hard rock. So it's very similar to minerals that we have on Earth, a mineral called forsterite, which is olivine. Um, and it's in gemstones on Earth. You might know the gemstones peridot. Um, and this is very hard. It's very rocky. As you know, if you've picked up a piece of a gemstone, it, you, you can't break it very easily. So, of course, it survived um, entry into this aerogel really well. Um, this kind of sample, the stuff that I analysed, um, the stuff that's like interplanetary dust particles and micrometeorites, that probably got deposited in this area and, and somewhat lost. So we are concentrating mostly on these very rocky fragments. Now, the problem with these fragments is that they were completely unexpected. As I explained earlier, if we're thinking about comets, um, we think that they formed in the very outer solar system, out where it's very cold um, and high temperature grains shouldn't be able to form because it's just too cold. So the gas and dust that was in next to the sun was able to be annealed to high temperature and form these kind of grains. So we think, as far as we understand it, the kind of grains that form these terminal particles could only have formed next to the sun in what we would generally call the planet forming or the asteroid forming region. But sure enough, we found them in a comet and we know it's a comet. It looks like a comet. It behaves like a comet. It's got a tail. It's got ice in it. It definitely forms somewhere in the outer solar system. So the thing that happened with the Stardust mission, it was that it completely turned this science on its head because suddenly we had to try and understand how these really high, really hardy, temp high temperature grains transported themselves all the way out to the comet forming region. Now, Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you of why that happened. Scientists are still trying to figure this out over a decade later. Um, we have no uh, reasonable mechanism still to explain how really, really tiny grains like this could get all the way out. There's ideas that there might be jets, uh, early jets that form um, in the early solar nebula that could 
transport grains out. But at the moment, our modelling suggests that grains that this size, um, this really small size, could not be transported that way. So at the moment, we need to understand how the early solar nebula mixed, how we get icy material moved around and how we get high temperature material ruined around. And we just don't know. We literally don't know why that happens still. But it's something scientists are going to continue to work on. And it's just kind of opening up science to us even more. It shows us that we need to go and study more of these objects because we just don't know enough about them. OK. Rosetta, I'm going to move on um, to my second. No, this is my my favourite mission. Definitely. I was um, involved kind of on the side of this mission. Um, the OU had an instrument called Ptolemy, which was on the lander. So I was involved in that team, but not from the beginning. Um, Rosetta launched in 2004, so I was doing my undergrad at that time, I think, um, and it had a 10 year journey to get to its comet. So and I have to point out, actually, it took 10 years prior to the launch to actually get the mission up and running. So, you know, as I'm sure you're all aware, space missions are slow. It takes a long time to plan and a long time to get them to where they need to go in space. Um, but the joy of it taking so long to catch up with its comet in space was that it got to do flybys of the Earth, flybys of Mars and it got to test out its instruments on the way. Um, for example, it went via asteroid Steins, um, which is um, often known as the diamond in the sky for obvious reasons here, and, and look at some of these objects and, and test out if um, its instruments were working. And I love this image um, that it took of moonrise over Earth as it did one of its gravitational assist flybys. Um, it's, it's crazy that it took 10 years but eventually it caught up with its comet in space. Obviously, we all know we can't just fly directly to a comet. They're on their own orbit. And in order for the spacecraft to catch up with it at the right speed on the right orbit, it had to um, do various orbital dynamics to get there. So what do we know about this comet? Well, it's called 67P churyumov Um, I, I think I've learned to say that correctly, but I don't know. Um, it's, it's a hard word to say. So we'll call it 67P. Um, we we're expecting the comet to be sort of potato shaped before we got there, um, because that's basically what we thought asteroids and comets should look like, vaguely round objects. They're not large enough to be perfectly round like a planet, but they should be kind of round. But then we got there and I mean, the media loved it because it became known as the rubber ducky. Um, it was sure enough this what is known as a contact binary comet, which is probably the result of a, a low velocity collision between two comets out in the um, Kuiper belt or, or cloud if it came from there. So um, it's basically very low velocity because otherwise these things would have just broken up. As I said, it's like a, a little fluffy snowball. Um, if they'd collided at high velocity, they would have just disintegrated. So they sort of just connected with each other um, and, and it's two objects. Um, so sure enough, we went to map this thing. I think I'll just go to my next slide because this is very, is it going to play? Hopefully that's playing for you. Um, I love this animation. Well, it's an animation, but it's made up of real images that were taken of um, the surface of the comet. So we entered into, I'm going to call it orbit around the comet, but there isn't actually enough gravity on the comet to um, for, for the, the spacecraft to be in kind of an orbit around it. And also it's not particularly round. So it had to go into powered flight around this object, which was, you know, that's very complicated to do for um, when this object is so far from Earth. But the team did it and they photographed every single meter of it. Um, and this guy in Sweden actually stitched all these images together to create this beautiful um, animation of, of the comet. And you can just see this surface now. It, you, it's artificially lightened because the comet's actually very dark. Um, it's as dark as black toner ink, so it's extremely dark because it contains a lot of organic matter. Um, but you can see it's reflected in the sunlight here as it turns. Um, you can also see some activity coming off the what we call the neck region of the comet um, as it was getting more active as it went towards the sun. Um, that this is a, what we call an outburst on 67p. So this is showing more of the activity from that neck region. Um, now, sure enough, we expect comets to get active as they go towards the sun because they're heated up and their ice is sublimate. Um, but this kind of thing has never been seen before. This, you know, seeing a jet this closely and in this much detail. 
but it also presented some problems for the spacecraft because if you want to orbit closely to get really high resolution images you you need to be close but you don't want to get your spacecraft stuck in one of these outbursts because it's not just gas it's going to have some dust coming off in there it's going to completely destroy the orbiter so the team had to be very careful as they got closer to the sun as the uh, following the comet on its orbit um, that they didn't destroy um, the orbiters as they went so it was yeah a lot of technical difficulties now I always kind of laugh about this section because um, it's quite famous that Rosetta was aiming to land on the comet um, and it was meant to just land and stay in one place. It was actually initially designed to hop around the comet and be a little kind of a hopper lander, but that was seen as far too complicated. But they actually ended up achieving that by accident in the end um, because it had almost three landings. Now, the problem with comets is that before we get to them, we really don't know what they're made of. Um, the team didn't know if the surface was going to be like candy floss or like concrete. So they had to design a lander that could cope with any of these conditions. Um, and sure enough, it turned out to be quite a bit harder than they were expecting. But there were also some technical issues with the lander as it was um, released down to the surface. Now, the technical issues, there was nothing they could do about them. So there was no point in not releasing the lander because, you know, they just weren't going to attempt a landing then. So they went for it. But sure enough, um, I think it was the thrusters um, were meant to fire as it reached the surface to counteract any bounce and that didn't work. And the harpoons um, didn't fire correctly. So it couldn't kind of kind of linch itself onto the surface. So it had a little bit of a bounce across the surface, which is actually okay because what the Ptolemy instrument designed by the Open University did it was designed to start its scientific analysis as soon as that first touchdown happened. So what they ended up getting was packets of analysis as the comet, as the um, lander went across the comet. So they got data from three different areas, um, which was absolutely amazing. And they could analyze all that data afterwards. Um, now, sadly, the lander ended up under a bit of a cliff um, and it was quite shadowed that area so they actually initially touched down exactly where they wanted which would have been a nice amount of sunlight to keep the solar, solar panels powered um, but sadly it ended up in in a shadowed region and so it could only perform its first um, basic scientific sequence and and then sadly it died and they couldn't get it back up and running again so I don't see it as a failure in that sense because this is the first time we'd ever tried this um, and they actually got analysis done and we learned a huge amount about this comet. As I said, it's really dark. So um, we think that this object formed um, in the Kuiper Belt um, and in quite cold temperatures, obviously, because we see a lot of um, ice on it. We found out it's a very low density. So when I've explained about these objects being very loosely bound, it really is very loosely bound. It's actually 75% porous, um, which is kind of, I, I imagine that's more than a sponge. Actually, I was going to look this up before I spoke, then I forgot, but I, I don't know what the porosity of a sponge is, but I can't imagine it's going to be much different to that. So the density is half that of water and it's less than ice. Um, and the only way to describe, to um, account for that is that it is very porous. It's got lots of air pockets within it. Um, the team tried to work out if that was big gaping holes within the comet. So it had maybe big blocks and then big caves in between, or they tried to figure out if it was tiny little bits of pore space um, between all those tiny bits of dust and they think it's actually the latter. So when we look back to these micrometeorite samples that I used to look at, you can see how that would be possible because there's lots of little holes in here where there could be air and that could account for the very low density of this object. Talking about kind of the water in there, um, we discovered it's not the supplier of Earth's water. So one of the theories is that comets and asteroids collided with the Earth over, over history and actually supplied the water that's now in our oceans and that we drink. Um, but we know that this particular comet did not supply our water. So when I say this particular one, obviously it didn't because it's still there and it, it didn't collide with Earth. But it it or its family of comets didn't supply our water. Now that doesn't mean that another family of comets from a different region in the solar system couldn't, couldn't represent the source of our water, but we don't think it was this one. Equally, it could be an asteroid, a very water-rich asteroid that could have supplied our water. So still lots of questions to answer, but we know that this particular type is not our source of water. And also they found glycine, an amino acid on the comet. Now that might be quite exciting to some of you is that it is exciting but it's not the first time glycine or amino acids have been found in space rocks um it's actually quite common um they were also found we found glycine on the stardust samples although people weren't sure at the time whether that could have been brought in by contamination from um, when they were 
dealing with the samples on Earth and the in the labs. But we confirmed there was glycine on um, this comet. So we're pretty sure that comets contain glycine. Now, they probably also contain other amino acids. And actually, there's a meteorite called Murchison, which contains so many amino acids. There's more on that in that particular rock than we have on Earth. So there seems to be more variation in space than we actually require on Earth for all the animals and plants that we have here. So that's cool. Um, this is the final image I think I've got of the Rosetta mission, and it's just it's it's selfie at the end. So you can see the beautiful solar panels um, on the wings coming out, and it's uh, from you know as the orbiter went by and uh, and said goodbye to to the comet as it went. And I just think it's a beautiful image of you know a man-made object next to this very very old solar system object. So I mentioned obviously Osiris Rex and Hayabusa 2. I'm not going to talk about these in any detail now. They're still ongoing, these missions or analysis is still happening. Hayabusa 2 got back uh, at the end of last year, I think it was, and Osiris Rex is due back in the next couple of years. Um, these are really exciting um, asteroids. They're very primitive asteroids. So they contain a lot of organic matter. They're not dissimilar to the comets that I've been looking at, actually. So these are going to be able to tell us a lot more about um, the rocks. Uh, in, but basically, they're very similar to the Winchkin meteorite as well. So it's really funny that people have, you know, space agencies have gone to all this trouble to go and sample these two objects. And then actually space sent us some of one of these for free, essentially, um, a carbonaceous chondrite. So um, the more samples, the better, though. We won't complain. So um, lots more science to come out of these two missions. Final two sections. I'm nearly done, so I can probably have some questions soon. Um, the final two sections of my book focus on looking to the future of what we might do about objects that um, are near us, the near Earth asteroids and comets, and how we might save planet Earth from a potential collision in the future, because it's almost certain that uh, an object will be on an Earth crossing orbit with us at some point in the future. We think we're safe for about the next 100 years based on the data that we have, but we can't really forecast anything beyond that at the moment. So we have amazing telescopes looking out at the night sky, continuously doing surveys to um, detect where these near-Earth objects are. They can work very well at objects over a kilometre. The objects below a, a kilometre are much harder to see, but we are starting to understand where all of those objects are as well. Um, the darker these objects are, the harder they are to see again. So the idea of these surveys is to really um, figure out the, the really detailed orbits of these objects, to figure out when if if they're going to collide with Earth at some point in the future. So, you know, they all they're all they're all being mapped. And so we don't need to worry. If you see something in the Daily Mail that said we're going to be hit by something, it probably is almost certainly rubbish. Um, but they do obviously hit. And sometimes we don't know these things are coming. If they're small, it's OK. Like you might remember in 2013 in Russia, the Chelyabinsk um, meteor event, that was a 19 meter um, sized asteroid that, that collided with um, the Earth. And it was quite a big event. It created a, a sonic boom as the thing exploded in the atmosphere, um, you know, created quite a bit of damage in, in the local town. Um, and we collected pieces of that rock, but it was relatively small, like 19 meters obviously is obviously quite a big object. But in terms of space, that's very teeny. Um, and we didn't know that was coming. We literally had no idea. Um, and it's 19 metres big, which is scary. Obviously, the dinosaur killing asteroid was about 10 kilometres in size. So, um, yeah, we definitely know that was coming. If we if we saw something that big in the sky heading for Earth, we would be able to detect it and figure out what we wanted to do with it. So one of our options is to deflect these objects. Um, the, the sooner we know about them, the better, because we have to do a very small correction on their trajectory um, to move them off an Earth crossing orbit if they're really far away. The closer they get to Earth, the longer we leave it, um, the bigger the correction we have to make. And if we leave it too late, there's really nothing we can do other than destroy the object. Now, if you're talking about a 10 kilometer wide asteroid, um, destroying it may not even be the best thing to do um, because you're going to end up with, you know, an unpredictable amount of smaller pieces that could still be quite large and would then be heading for potentially different parts of the planet. Um, so there's a lot of science going on behind this at the moment. Um, a few missions that are, are, are kind of in progress to try and figure out what we might do in this scenario so that basically we have in the future, a mission ready to go um, to protect our planet from such an event, because it will almost certainly be happening at some point in the future. And the final bit is space mining. Um, when I wrote this book, I mean, it's now it's such a fast moving field that, you know, three, three, four years has moved on and, and things have really changed. But really, it, 
this final section of the final chapter that will give quite a good overview of space mining in terms of asteroids and comets. Of course, we're talking about it on, on the moon now as well. Really, the idea is how can we um, become a spacefaring um, race, essentially? Like, How can we go into space and support ourselves whilst we're out there? Because it's super expensive to take everything we need from Earth. To launch mass off the Earth is just, it's, it's really expensive. So we need to be able to go into space to get the materials we need, whether that be water that we could get from asteroids and comets, and we could use that to fuel for, for life, or we could use it for rocket fuel, whatever we need. But we could also use the precious metals that are found in really high quantities in um, asteroids, and we could use those to 3D print tools that we might need in space, or um, even to make spacecraft that could then go from the moon to further into deep space loads and loads of issues i think you recently had a talk although i didn't um didn't see it about international maybe international law in space um but there's there are many many issues that need to be figured out in this respect and um, the ownership of these objects is going to be a bit a, a bit debated still and also the economic viability sure enough the cost of launches is decreasing with reusable rockets but um, it's still super expensive to get up there. And if we want to bring the material back to Earth, that maybe isn't the best idea. It's maybe best that we use it to further exploration of space. But it's a really exciting field. And I think um, it's something to keep an eye on. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. And I think it can be used for the good. Although I feel like it's getting a bit of a bad, um, maybe bad reputation at the moment. So we'll see how that goes over the next decade. So yeah, a bit of a really quick summary, although I've been speaking for ages, I realise, but um, it's, yeah, it's basically that's that's the, the, the what my book's about. It's been out for a while. Um, it's had some good reviews. And if you want to buy it, please do. It's still available, hardback, paperback, ebook, audiobook. There we go. I've done my, my bit. But I can't finish without talking about my next book because I'm very excited. It's coming out in September and it's called Fire and Ice and the Volcanoes of the Solar System. Um, so I'm sort of coming back to my original love of volcanoes, but then mixing that with all my knowledge about space now. Um, it was so fun to research this book. A lot of the stuff I, I did, you know, I need to interview people and, and find out new stuff, which was just so exciting. So Volcanoes all over the place, obviously, Venus and, and Mars and Mercury. We know the terrestrial planets and all those around us have volcanoes and Mars, of course, is the largest mountain in the solar system. It doesn't look very large. I always find these images really annoying because it's a very flat, but very, very high, higher than Mount Everest volcano. Um, but it just looks like a blip on the surface of Mars. But it's um, it's phenomenal in size. Um, but I'm not just looking at the kind of rocky, what we consider rocky volcanoes, where actually the ice part of the book comes from the fact that I'm looking at cryovolcanoes or ice volcanoes. Um, and they come from the weirdest of places. So you might be aware that with the New Horizons mission, Pluto found what it thinks are ice volcanoes on the surface of Pluto. But even um, asteroids contain ice volcanoes. So this is a Hunamons on series on the top left. Um, and it, I just love this image because it actually kind of looks like a volcano, but it's actually made of uh, effectively like brine, like salty ice. Um, so yeah, there's some really, really cool stuff going, cool, excuse the, excuse the pun when I talk about cryovolcanoes, but yes, it's very cool. Um, and my favourite um, moon, I get to talk about my favourite moon finally, which is Io, um, which is a moon around Jupiter, which I just absolutely love. And it's the most volcanically active object in the solar system. Um, and so you can learn more about that and about the history of volcanoes and how we've come to understand them um, and then how we've gone out to explore those in the solar system around us. So UK release of that book is September 30th. You can pre-order now um, and I've got a few events coming up. I've got one in uh, Washington DC. I don't know who's called, where you guys are all calling in from but I think that will be online anyway that one. I've been invited to the Royal Institution on September 30th and I'm at Norwich Science Festival on October 29th. Um, so I think that's me. I, I was way longer than I said I was going to be and I apologise for that. Um, so anyway, I'll hand back over. <laughs> I don't, after that talk, I don't think anybody's going to complain that it ran over at all. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I think your enthusiasm just shone through there and it was just a really wide scoping talk, you know, from, from the birth of the solar system uh, to the missions to the volcanoes. I, I absolutely thought that was fantastic, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for coming to do the talk for us. And and of course, with Tracy watching, um, hopefully you'll come back and do the talk on volcanoes later on in the year. We'd absolutely be happy to do you, but uh, be guinea pigs.
That would be brilliant. Yeah, I know. I, I felt like when I got my first invite to go to the Royal Institution and talk about like do it for the first time to that kind of audience was kind of crazy. So, yeah, maybe I'll have a practice before then. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good guinea pigs. You could definitely use it for us. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go into the question and answer session in a minute and I just wanted to tie a few things up and um, while you were talking there was actually something that struck me that I think is a really good point that I can make now um, and make for those watching on the recording so if you're not actually studying with the Open University but you're thinking about it or you're early in your Open University studies a lot of the stuff that Natalie was talking about is included in the modules that you study in the Open University and I absolutely think it's one of the brilliant strengths of the OU um, that it has amazing space research and then applies it to all the undergraduates. So um, I've just been told on on a chat uh, separately there that one of the second year courses, you use a Ptolemy-like instrument and uh, practice doing that kind of science. I myself did S818, the uh, postgraduate space science course. And if anybody ever gets the chance to do it, I would highly recommend it. All the research that Natalie was talking about, um, analyzing the impacts of the Stardust mission, you do exactly the same science. Um, and you learn about all the orbital mechanics and the mission engineering of Ptolemy, uh, not Ptolemy, sorry, uh, Philae and the Rosetta mission. And it's just, I just couldn't recommend it high enough. So if you're watching the recording and you think I've got nothing doing from January, eight months long, go and do that course. It's amazing. Um, so before we go on to the uh, question and answer session, then I just wanted to say thank you to anybody watching on the recording. Um, this week we've achieved 350 members of the space club which is absolutely amazing whoever thought it'd be that big in in the first academic year of it being set up um and uh, if you're listening live then um in the chat is the links to join if you haven't already but on the uh the youtube uh, recording the links will be put into the comments and please um comment join share like do all that good stuff um and we'd love to see you as part of the club and to watch more talks um so on the screen now somewhere should be um, subscribe and share. Please use that. Um, but I'll say thank you to anybody watching the recording and uh, we'll move on to the question and answer session.